All right, guys, something I've been interested in, like, uh, let's check it out. Nintendo and Sega's strange ties to the Yuk Yakuza. Let's check it out. Yes, video games. Yeah, video games are awesome, man. Over the past few decades. Ah, yes, video games. Don't know why it restarted. We'll just roll with it. Games. Over the past few decades, they have grown so popular Sega. that they are pretty much impossible to avoid now. But don't take my word for it. There are raw numbers that confirm just how huge gaming is these days. In oh, we just gotta look at Twitch and find out, you know what I mean? Just gotta look at Twitch for a little, like a few seconds, really. 2020, the global gaming market was valued at $159 billion. Bro. Making it almost four times as large as the movie industry. Guys, if Obviously, I got 1% of that. Kind of money involved. 1% of that, I'd be set for more than, like, 10 lifetimes, bro. Well, maybe, maybe inflation would be adjusted just a little, but you know what I mean? That's wild. But some companies in the industry have grown to be absolutely massive and successful. However, these huge amounts of cash also <laughs> come... You said, does this change your mind? It would for me. It would for me, brothers. With a few downsides, like attracting... Oh my gosh. You guys saw his uh, look of excitement there, man. Oops, who want in on the money? Japan. We're, we're, we're all trying to come up here, guys. We're all trying to make profit, bro. Some of us lose money, some of us gain money. Home to some of the industry's most legendary game developers is no exception in this regard. I know, just like this small freaking like group of islands is the freaking one of the best game, the best game developer in the world, I think. In the land of the rising sun. I'm a huge Nintendo fan. The Yakuza have ruled the criminal underworld for centuries. And yeah, I don't know much about them because, like, they live over there, bro. And, and some in the USA, but. Might even have been involved with your favorite game developer. What? While there are. It's like, uh, gangs in the army and stuff. Many Japanese developers that have some sort of history related to the criminal underworld. I want to focus on two companies in particular today who also happened to be fierce rivals for a while. Nintendo and Sega. And boy, Sega. do I have some interesting stuff to tell you about these two. Illegal I think Sega, I think Sega's a smaller company there because Nintendo's got the gaming console. Sega, what does Sega have? Sonic? Like, I don't know what they have, man. Gambling, secret operations, a kidnapping, a smashed arcade machine, and even a shooting. What this the heck? is the story of Nintendo, Sega, and the Yakuza. Alright, let's see it, let's see it. Aniki. Last time, uh, last time we, we, uh, watched a video about Japan, like the sumo wrestlers. There's so many terms for us to learn that we just like. It was hard for us to, for me to catch up, bro. It really was, and uh, learn the terms on the on the fly like that. And no. I know what you're thinking, Nintendo. What does the world's most family-friendly and innocent gaming company have to do with something as dangerous as the Yakuza? Now, while doing research for this video, I shared exactly the same opinion. What I found was quite interesting though. Nintendo was never run by the Yakuza or anything, nor do they have any noteworthy connections to the underworld these days. However, there were certain time periods in the company's history where they had no choice but to engage with Japan's underworld. One of those uh oh, Are they, do they want a stake in the company or something, guys? Uh oh. Times came at the very beginning of the company itself. To understand the connection between Nintendo and the Yakuza, we also have to learn a little bit about the history of gambling in Japan. It was the year 1549 when Portuguese sailors first brought playing cards to Japan. These Portuguese card decks quickly caught on with the Japanese people and made gambling a huge thing while doing so. Over a hundred years... It's like trading cards, man. Guys, anyone else feel like playing games is just a gamble? Because you, 
you know, you know, there's a, there's certain odds that you'd win and there's certain odds you'd lose. I swear, I get angry just as if I was, like, gambling. Just playing, uh, you know, PKing or, or just playing Smash Ultimate or something, bro. I, I do get quite angry. Later, in 1663, Japan had entered a self-imposed isolation from the rest of the world, which Heck. also brought with it a ban on many foreign goods. This included, of course, Portuguese playing cards, and consequently led to a... Bro, they're banning cards? It's like China all over again. We just watched a video on China. ...ban on gambling itself. Those who just couldn't get enough of playing cards for money now had to do so in secret, and it would stay that way for around two... Oh, is it because of gambling itself? It's like Jagex cracking down on gambling, man. ...two hundred years, when a country's isolation finally came to an end. The Meiji government, which brought many Western influences back into Japan, also legalized the production and use of playing cards. These were special kinds of cards though, called Hanafuda, which usually had artworks of things like plants and animals on them. They were quite beautiful, like little card-sized paintings. Guys, I wonder how much they're worth now, guys. These cards were also a huge business opportunity for many. Among them, a man by the name of Yamauchi Huzajiro. He was not only an entrepreneur, he also had a knack for gambling, a passion he could now finally pursue without committing a crime. In 1889... Yay, for the win! Crimes are not good, guys. Crimes are sign. He started his own company, which produced handmade Hanafuda cards for his fellow card players and gamblers. The name of Yamauchi's company carried the name Yamauchi Nintendo. Oh! Those foreign around gambling guys? What? Nintendo started as a company in the city of Kyoto, cultural capital and former actual capital of Japan. It changed their capital, guys. It doesn't. Uh, 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 I don't think I had know about a single instance that USA changed their capital. In fact, they were still based there and even stayed at the exact same location that the company was founded. Nintendo player card, playing card, oh my gosh. ...until the year 2000. Actually, the location of this headquarters is very important to our story. In the late 19th century, when Nintendo was founded, this area was absolutely packed with Yakuza, particularly the gambling type, also known as Bakuto. To be even more specific, a gang called Aisu Kotetsukai, founded in 1868, was the dominant gang in Kyoto at the time. Uh-oh, are the Yakuza going to take them over or something, or are they going to join forces, guys? What's going to happen, man? I don't know what the Yakuza does nowadays, guys, but we got to learn the history first, you know what I mean? Interestingly, <clears throat> just like Nintendo, they are still around today. Oh, snap. Of course, for a car producer, being surrounded by gamblers was not only convenient, but also very profitable. Soon, Yamauchi's Hanafuda car... Just like it is for BTCs and OSRS, All right, guys? That guy is close to a trillion GP. ...arts became hugely popular with the people of Kyoto, including gamblers and criminals. Rumor has it that the Yakuza loved the Nintendo card designs so much that they got them tattooed. Funny to think that Nintendo has been a source of tattoo designs for over a hundred years now. Guys, would you get a tattoo like that, guys? Yamauchi might actually... It seems like it'd cost a lot, though. We have appreciated the Yakuza as more than just customers, though. Rumor has it that the name Nintendo itself is a reference to the criminals. What? Now, it's important to know that the word Nintendo has always been shrouded in mystery, even among native Japanese speakers and em I know, right, guys? employees of the company. Most frequently, the name is translated as Leaf Luck to Heaven. However, Japanese... Okay, okay. Never knew the translation. These writing, kanji letters specifically, are incredibly <laughs> complex and can easily be misinterpreted. This complexity has led to many, many theories. Dang, it's like a whole conspiracy around the word n being Nintendo, guys. Well, wow. over the years, as to what Nintendo might actually stand for. Let's take a closer look. Is that why they're shutting down, um, like Smash events and stuff? A look, I don't know. <laughs> kanji letters that Nintendo is spelled with. Do is not important in this case. It's simply a letter which was traditionally used to describe a store. Nin and ten are what we really want to look at. Man, oh, ten is a number in English. That's all I know. The kanji ten 
is also used for the word Tengu, which is a mythical creature from Shinto religion and is usually depicted with an extremely long nose. Whoa, it's like Pinocchio, man. Wait, is that ca are those cannabis leaves? Those look like cannabis leaves. The nose in Japanese is called Hana, which just so happens to be the same word used for flower. Hana is also included in the word Hanafuda, the name of the aforementioned playing cards. In the Osaka right. and Kyoto regions, where Yamauchi and Nintendo were based, people would rub their nose as a sneaky way of saying, hey, I'm looking for Hanafuda, or gambling games. Yeah, bro. Was it outlawed or something, bro? Gambling's still outlawed in uh, everywhere but Vegas for the most part, right, guys? Everywhere but Nevada for some reason in USA. I guess you could do it online now, but... Addicted, addicting thing to do, right guys? So what does all of this have to do with Nintendo? Well, when Yamauchi's premium cards weren't doing all that well anymore, he started a new line of more affordable cards under the name Tengu Cards. This name was not chosen without a good reason. For card players, the word Ten generally meant Tengu and therefore was synonymous with, you guessed it, gambling. As stated before, Yamauchi was an avid gambler and had surely rubbed his nose a few times as well, looking for card games in Kyoto. So the letter 10 in Nintendo might have been a hint towards the Yakuza-related Bakuto or gamblers, basically saying, these cards I'm making, I make them for you guys. Snap, bro. Hey, gambling's uh, so, so popular, so can't get the gambler out of them, it seems. Same with the USA. I don't blame you. Lottery tickets and stuff. If you think that all of this is a bit of a reach. But there is an interesting explanation for the Nin letter as well. This time, the explanation comes from none other than the Yakuza themselves. Jake Adelstein, a famous Yakuza reporter and author of the book Tokyo Vice, interviewed two Yakuza members about this whole Nintendo naming situation. Don't worry, their theory is a bit more straightforward. There is a chat. Interesting, so we got somebody documenting them. We, we might have to pick up that book or something Japanese one day. word called Ninkyo, which could be translated as chivalry. This word is written with the same Nin letter as Nintendo. Now, Nintendo putting this letter into their name is nothing particularly suspicious or anything. However, the word Ninkyo is synonymous with Japan's crime syndicates. The Yakuza traditionally saw themselves as heroes of the common folk, similar to Robin Hood. They see themselves as chivalrous. They see themselves as ninkyo. Guys, why do they always draw like the Japanese? Uh, they, I think they often draw the like uh, artwork back then, make their eyes like that. I don't know why, guys. It looks like one of my like uh, thumbnails because I, I have like a little bit of a cross eye. Cross eye, man. <clears throat> Did Nintendo founder Yamauchi possibly show appreciation to his main customer base with his company's name? There is certainly some sort of connection between Nintendo and Yakuza groups during the company's early days, so let me know what you think in the comments. There are two more short stories related to Nintendo. All I know is that it's red and white, just like their flag. Oh, and the Yakuza. The Nintendo logo. That I thought were interesting. For the first one, we jump forward 70 years to the 1960s. By now, Nintendo had moved into a bigger office and was led by President Yamauchi Hiroshi, the grandson of Nintendo's founder. They had also expanded into other areas. Dang, we haven't even gotten to the point where they're making video games yet. We're 10 minutes in almost. Including toys and even the taxi business. Yeah, I don't doubt it with the 10 minutes he did explaining, um... The trading cards and stuff, right guys? They never stopped doing what they got started with as a company though. Even today, you can buy Nintendo produced Hanafuda cards. By the yeah. 1960s, oh, yeah. these cards- I, I watched another video that uh, they still produce trading cards. Cards were not made by hand anymore. Instead, factories now did all the work. One of Nintendo's card factories hired a young man by the name of Yokoi Gunpei, who would go on to make it big at Nintendo as the producer of the Kid Icarus and Metroid games. His crowning yeah. achievement though would- 
That's Pit. Pit looks so different in Smash, guys. <laughs> would of course be the creation of the Game Boy. One of they changed Pit's hair color. The most influential electronic products of all time. Before changing the world of handheld gaming forever, Yokoi would inspect Nintendo's machines for producing Hanafuda cards. These machines had to be regularly inspected for a very particular reason. In an interview, Yokoi recalled, This task was important since these cards were often used for gambling. People from the local mafia would often come to Nintendo, very angry. What? Why, man? Because doesn't Japan also produce, like, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards? By then... Because Yu-Gi-Oh cards are awesome, man. Nintendo had long left behind any supposed Yakuza ties, that's for sure. Still, it's kind of funny to think that the local Yakuza would regularly swing by a Nintendo factory and yell at the Game Boy creator for losing the money with faulty cards. Our final Nintendo... It's not their fault, man. So when you made some counterfeits or something, I don't know. ...story takes place in November of 19... Don't hate the player, hate the game. All right, I don't know. Never mind, other way around, right? Something like that, guys. Apologies. By now, Nintendo had been in the video game business for about a decade and had become a household name worldwide. The word Nintendo was now synonymous with video games themselves, and their first home console, the NES, might have saved video games from an untimely death in the 80s. In November of 1990, Nintendo was ready to release their second generation 16-bit console, the SNES, or Super Famicom. Now, now things are gonna go hyper speed for them, bro. They're they're really gonna make a lot of become a huge company. With their Switch becoming the most best-selling console, by the way, for them, I believe. Maybe maybe it was DS, something like that, but still. Famicom <laughs> in Japan. Based on pre-orders, Nintendo already knew that the system would be a massive success upon its release. However, they also had concerns about the release of the Super Famicom and the involvement of, you guessed it, the Yakuza. The Yakuza, just like Nintendo, were at their peak and were making money from all sorts of ventures. Snap, those look like freaking Yakuza, bro. Business suits and everything, man. Scary guys, scary guys. One very profitable business was stealing electronic devices and reselling them for a high price. The Super Famicom, which was difficult to obtain for some due to its massive popularity, could have been a great source of income for the gangs. Nintendo was afraid that the Yakuza would intercept the Super Famicom delivery routes, steal the cargo, and ruin the much awaited release. As a solution, Nintendo Dang, bro, they, I thought Japan was more peaceful than that, guys. ...came up with a plan titled Operation Midnight Shipping. The plan was simple, but effective. Operation like how the US government calls stuff Operation This, Operation That, right, guys? Instead of delivering the console at regular delivery times, the Super Famicom boxes were secretly loaded onto trucks around midnight when the people of Japan were fast asleep. The delivery routes and times were kept a complete secret. Only a handful of people were informed of the Okay, okay, doing the night shift. Good job, good job. ...the plan in order to make sure that everything went over smoothly. Fast forward to a few hours later and all 300,000 consoles that were pre-ordered had been safely delivered to stores, with no Yakuza member that didn't pre-order the Super Famicom getting their hands on one. Genius. Mario World, man. But what, what, what if they were stealing the ROMs or something? It was also around this time, in the early 1990s, that Nintendo had to deal with some real competition in the video game market for the very first time. The name of their biggest rival at the time, Sega, and their ties to the Yakuza run much deeper than those of Nintendo. Right, all right. Let's see it. Let's see it, guys. Sega having ties to the Japanese mafia, surely. Guys, they never even had a Sega console, man. They got out of the game a while ago. With that, with like the Dreamcast. Dreamcast is good because it had that one uh, Sonic game. I liked the Dreamcast, but it makes a lot more sense than it does in Nintendo. They did end up merging, guys. For the most part, right, guys. Sonic came to Nintendo. In case. 
Their whole marketing approach in the early 90s, when they really started competing with Nintendo, was to seem like an edgier, more rebellious counterpart to Nintendo's family-friendly image. Actually, doesn't this kind of mirror the difference between the rebellious Yakuza and the reserved and calm Japanese citizens? Of course, Sega is also the developer of a video game franchise that revolves around the Yakuza themselves and has caused millions of people worldwide to become interested in the Japanese criminal underworld. Are you serious? I am, of course, talking about the Ryoga Gotoku series, known in the West simply as Yakuza. I honestly expected to find a story about one of the developers being ex-Yakuza or criminals being involved in the development of the game somehow. After all, there well, is- They made a game called Yakuza? Oh my gosh. It's a famous news article where real Yakuza members played the games and stated that they were indeed very accurate depictions of the Yakuza lifestyle. This is the Yakuza? No, this has to be a different game, right guys? <laughs> What I found, though, were two stories in particular that are different from what I expected. Maybe it was a game. Arguably, much more interesting. In 2004, Sega became part of a merger with the Sammy Corporation, one of Japan's largest manufacturers of pachinko machines. Pachinko is Japan's favorite gambling game. Imagine it as a sort of mix between a pinball machine and a slot machine. Pachinko is, of course, an incredibly profitable business. This profitability, mixed with the Yakuza's long-time involvement in gambling, naturally meant that they wanted in on the money. While over the years, government oversight and regulations have largely pushed the Yakuza away from making it big in the gambling business, there are seemingly still connections with big companies to be found, which became clear just a few years ago. Thing, just, just like how the mafia has involvement. Morning of January 8th, 2015. Like stocks or something, I don't know. 15. A security guard of a residence in Tokyo's Itabashi area hears a single gunshot being fired. While no one was harmed, he noticed that one of the lights had been shattered by the gunshot. Additionally, the shooter left three unused bullets in front of the residence. The house belonged to none other than Satomi Hachime the CEO of Sega Sammy. The incident... Dang, bro. Going at... Come on, man. Leave the CEO alone, bro. He's just trying to make some good games, right, guys? Which seemed like a sort of warning for the chairman. Had Yakuza written all over it. So, the police started investigating. Two years later, in 2017, a total of three men were arrested as suspects in a case. Two of these three men, who supposedly carried out the crime itself, were not Yakuza members. One of them was an employee at a real estate agency, the other had no occupation stated. The third man, however, who was suspected of hiring the two perpetrators for the job. Bro, oh, they, they always catch people that hire hitman guys, for sure, man. Was Yamamoto Takahiro, a member of the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi. The Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi was just recently formed at the time, after splitting away from the biggest gang in the history of organized crime in Japan the Yamaguchi Gumi. Since 2017, no further news have come out about the case, which leads me to believe that Yamamoto and the two men did indeed commit the crime. With Sega Sammy being hugely involved in the pachinko business, and with it gambling, it's not unrealistic to think that Sega is at least somewhat involved with the Yakuza, even now. Now if that last story was a hint at ties between the Yakuza and Sega, then our next story is a full-on confirmation. But there is a catch with this one. It has never been proven, without a doubt, that these claims are actually about Sega. However, at the end of the video, I will present a few Perhaps, maybe, maybe not, guys. Uh, details. I do not know. That made me 99% sure that we are, indeed, talking about Sega here. The story itself comes from a book called The Untold History of Japanese Game Developers As I would totally pick up that book. Volume 2 by John Shepaniak. In the book, the author interviews many people with experience in Japan's gaming industry. Among them was a man who had worked for companies like Square Enix and, of course, Sega. He also asked to be interviewed under a pseudonym and to have certain words and company names redacted for safety reasons. In the book, the man goes by the name Nanashi Hideo. After talking about some 
blurred out the blurred out the, the picture as well for you know anonymity anonymity reasons. Unreleased projects that Nanashi worked on. The author of the book asks him about a falling out with a certain company between 1997 and 1998. Okay, it's oddly specific. Out of nowhere, guys. Right, guys. Where almost casually, Nanashi starts telling a story about a kidnapping that was carried out by said gaming company. Oh, that's too much. That's too much. Beefing with the huge gaming companies. With the hey, they're huge enough to, you know, they're huge gang, though. Help of the Yakuza. The victim of the kidnapping was none other than Nanashi's younger sister, who had just graduated high school and started attending university at the time. Nanashi had to come up with a plan to rescue his sister, but had to be very careful not to get himself in jail at the same time. He then hired one of his subordinates to get a truck mounted crane and pick up an arcade machine made by the company in question that Nanashi had acquired in advance. The subordinate took the truck and the arcade machine to the company's headquarters, lifted the arcade up with the crane and dropped it, smashing it into pieces in front of their doorstep. Dang bro, that's quite- that, that makes a statement for sure, man. Nanashi then sent a letter to the company saying, one of your employees will be next. Oh, snap. As for Nanashi's sister, she was fortunately returned shortly after. Following this wild story, he offers a few more interesting details about the company's leadership. Members of the board of directors, they were involved with the underworld. The buying and selling of game machines itself was mixed up in that world, because that's the kind of business that attracts the Yakuza. Nowadays, they are heavily involved in the pachinko industry. So the old members of the board, they would have short fingers, like the Yakuza would get their fingers cut off. There were really people like that. Wait, why would they do that? No, what the heck? That's scary. The author also asked Nanashi if this Oops. interview could cause any problems for him. Nanashi replied, I might get murdered by <laughs> Mostly the bosses behind Japanese slot machines. Wait, why did they blurt it out, man? Machine makers are the South Korean mafia. And if <laughs> doesn't kill me, I could lose my livelihood. So make sure this story is an anonymous interview. I think there are many people in the Japanese games industry who strongly want to talk, but cannot show their name. There are many dark stories. Now, now bro, we don't know much, we don't know much, you know what I mean? Not much Japan news that makes makes it to USA. Unless it's like new video game releases, right guys? I would like to talk about- At least I don't- I know, I'm not heavily that invested in it. ...about why I and many people online think that this might be Sega. You may have noticed that the book did not use random amounts of X's to redact names. The company itself is always hidden by exactly four X's. When talking about the kidnapping story, Nanashi also mentioned that he is talking about a big company and their motive for the kidnapping. Wait, four. Oh, so Sega, right? Was to stop. It's the same amount of letters. Him from associating with Nintendo. There are not that many big Japanese companies that were in fierce competition with Nintendo. Only Sony and Sega spring to mind. Well, Sony- Dang, Sony's coming out of Japan as well, man. They- Almost like a... Monopoly, guys. Almost. It would certainly fit the four X's. Nanashi also mentions that the company is now heavily involved in the pachinko industry. As far as I know, Sony is not in the pachinko business at all. Another hint comes from Nanashi talking about the location of the company's headquarters. I just smashed it in front of their main office in the middle of the night. It was easy. The headquarters are in now, but back then, they were near the airport. Their office building was right in front of a major street, in a commercial district without any residential homes. The excess hiding the current location perfectly fit the word Shinagawa, an area of Tokyo that Sega currently calls its home. The airport that Nanashi mentions could be Haneda Airport, near Yep, he did his research, he found out where it was. Otori in Tokyo, where Sega had its headquarters until 2018. Nanashi at one point also told the author of the book about the so-called Kakuribeya, which were used by the company. If you search for and Kakuribeya in Japanese, you can find many articles. Guys, I wonder why he's blurting out the, though, man. If he found it out pretty quickly, why would I even do that? Like this. 
At the end of the 90s, Sega ended up in multiple newspapers across Japan for the use of isolation rooms, or kakuribeya. Basically, these were windowless rooms with nothing inside. Around the turn of the new millennium, Sega started struggling financially and wanted to cut down on their workforce. They would allegedly put unwanted workers into these isolation rooms with nothing to do, where they would stay until they quit their job. It's important to mention though... Dude, why? <laughs> That's like torture, bro! ...that Sega was not the only Japanese company who utilized this cruel tactic when trying to push out employees. My According head. to many reports, the use of kakuribeya is unfortunately fairly widespread in Japan. Still? So what do you think? Is the company in question actually Sega? Or is there another solution to the puzzle? Maybe, maybe. Also, let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, maybe- Guys, let's uh, read some comments here. That's why the Yakuza games are so good. Sega had insider information and experience. Oh, they did make the games? Oh, well, it's, it's more, how, how more can uh, you get uh, that, <laughs> that's evidence that they are involved, right guys? They make a whole game about it. That's why uh, I always said that the Smash Bros community just approached Nintendo if they were crime bosses. Oh, we got a comment about it. What's up, Janice? Jans? Then there wouldn't be some problems with the organizing events. Not really strange. Their products for a century are mostly exclusively used by the N Yakuza. Most Japanese built had dealings with them. Sony definitely did. Now I understand why a Nintendo lawyer acts like Yakuza and why Sega makes good Yakuza games. I'd be very interested in the connections of Sony to the Yakuza if they were to have one. Oh yeah, they don't, they left out Sony. You had me hooked throughout amazing storytelling and research, yeah. Good video, good video. Yeah, another top tier game doc YouTuber who invokes state of shock upon realizing a few subscribers they have. Oh yeah, well. Only uh, 3,000 guys, only 3,000. But yeah guys, that is a video. That is a video, guys. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next one. Peace out, everyone.